We're going to look at the Bible passage now, and the passage we're going to look at is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. Let's hear God's word. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we have access in one spirit to the Father. That's God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this precious, beautiful word. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, that you have given us the gospel. And we praise you for your grace and kindness and mercy. We ask your help now as we do the work of listening to a sermon. We pray that we would be changed, that we would love you more, love each other more, and that we would do all to your glory. Bless us now, O oh God, by the power of your spirit, through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So we have three points to look at today. Jesus, the preacher. Jesus preached peace. Jesus gives access. Jesus, the preacher. Jesus preached peace. Jesus gives access. In this chapter that we've been looking at so far, especially after verse 11, we've been looking at the, the work of Christ, what his death on the cross achieves, what he's done and what his death means for us as Christians. And um, Paul says in verse 17 that Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. You'll remember a few weeks ago we looked at the earlier parts of this passage and it talked about how those who were far off non-jewish christians or gentile christians um, were not given privileges and were divided from jewish christians or jewish people excuse me in the old covenant um, they were in the old covenant the jewish people could go into a part of the temple that non-jewish people couldn't and so in Christ, Jewish and non-Jewish Christians are equal because all that's been fulfilled and taken away. So what we see here is the unity, again, the unity of Jewish and non-Jewish Christians in the body of Christ. And those who were far off had the same gospel message preached as those who were near. But Paul uses a very special and important phrase here he says Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far off and those who were near those who were far off are the Ephesian Christians now Jesus didn't actually preach to the Ephesians did he this letter was written in AD 60 around about that's decades after Jesus's death resurrection and ascension and Yet, Paul says, Jesus himself preached to them. There's no record of Jesus ever leaving, um, apart from his, when he was a baby, leaving Israel. So how did he preach the message to the Ephesians? Well, he commissioned preachers. The Lord Jesus Christ gave very special people the power to preach the gospel. Now, every Christian is called to preach the gospel, um, but, and it says later on in Ephesians 2, the apostles had a very, very particular and special and unique ministry. They were for the founding of the Christian church. It says in the next passage, um, that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. They were for the founding of the church and Peter was given in Matthew 16, the keys to the kingdom. And he opened that gate to the kingdom in Acts 2 when he, on the day of Pentecost, when he proclaimed the good news. And in Acts 15, he says, I was commissioned that people would hear the word of God. He was the first, he, in Acts chapters 10 and 11, he preaches um, to Cornelius and non-Jewish Christians. 
they have the same experience that the Jewish Christians had in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit comes down and they speak with other tongues and prophesy. And that was the sign that God was giving that this was the new covenant era. Jewish people and non-Jewish people are equal in God's sight and the same message is there. So Christ commissioned the apostles to be the founding of the church. Christ also commissioned preachers and then the apostles commissioned preachers. And he always said, he said to them in Luke chapter 10, when the preachers went out, whoever hears you, hears me. And whoever hears me, hears the one who sent me. So when, the, when preachers go and preach the word of God faithfully, it's as if God is speaking through the preacher. That doesn't mean we're in a, some sort of ecstatic state. It's not that. It's when we faithfully unfold the scripture to you, God is speaking by the power of the Spirit through his precious word. And that is how Jesus preached peace to the Ephesian Christians. He did it through the ministry of the apostles and through the pastors and the preachers. This should give us great pause for thought and great reverence for the ministry of preaching. Not because I'm special or because Martin's special, though he is, we both are, we all are, but because it's God's way of speaking his truth to the church. We should value highly the ministry of preaching. Indeed, the Protestant Reformation, which we remembered last month, was about that. It was about putting preaching at the centre of the worship service. Not because the preachers are important, though they are, but not because of the preachers, but because of the message they're preaching. That is the centre. D.L. Moody put it another way. God speaks to us in the Bible, we speak to him in prayer, and we better let God do most of the talking. Yeah, it's God, but Jesus himself, by the power of the Spirit, is preaching the word. To you now, on this video, to SVC when we meet, and across the globe, Jesus himself so we should have immense reverence for the scripture, immense reverence for God's message in the Bible. We should come to the word hungry and thirsty to meet with God. We should come to the word, as Peter says, to so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation 1 peter chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 that's how we should come to the word and then when we hear it we should receive it with faith and love and practice it and meditate on it and put it into practice don't let a sermon don't let a sermon just go in one ear and out the other. Get the sermon notes, get the prayer points, pray over them and meditate on them because every sermon we hear, it's as if Christ himself is speaking to us. So make an effort to listen carefully. Make an effort to prepare to come to church to hear the scriptures preached and delight in hearing Christ's voice through his word. That's how we hear his voice. When he says, my sheep hear my voice, he was, in John chapter 10, he was talking about the preaching of the gospel. So delight in it. For Christ himself has preached this message to you now. Point two, Jesus preaches peace. Jesus preaches peace. We long for peace, don't we? That's what we pray for and hope for on this Remembrance Sunday. We remember those who've fallen and commit to working for a better world. Indeed, after the First World War, when Remembrance Sunday started, that was the ultimate aim 
Um, it was a way of saying, we must never let this happen again. It's so appalling what happened, so awful. We must never let this happen again. Obviously, history shows that that hope wasn't met, and we remember those who died in the Second World War and um, subsequent wars. But we also we also pledge to try and work for a better world, and because peace is important. And the gospel is the message of peace. It says, as I said, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Peace. We are familiar with what that means. Um, and Jesus, as Paul's spelling out in this passage, Christ by his death brings peace, brings peace with God. Um, God was in the world. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. And we know what reconciliation is. He, it's when two parties who are at war or at hostilities then stop being hostile and become friends. Uh, a beautiful biblical example is in Luke chapter 15 where the prodigal son runs away, um, squanders his father's money and then goes back and the father runs out to meet him and kisses him and hugs him and throws a party for him. That's what it means to be reconciled. That's what God does for us. Once we were his enemies and now we're seated at his table. God was in Christ. Christ, who is both God and man, was, and he was in the world, reconciling the world to himself by his death. To give us, as we'll look at in a minute, access to the father. So Jesus does that. Jesus does that. The other great passage about peace is Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not at enmity anymore. How did Jesus do this? He died and rose again so that we could be justified. And now some of you have picked up a copy of this, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Question 33, what is justification? Here we go. Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight. Only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. So what we mean by that is Christ on the cross all our sins were placed on him and he paid the price for them so they're gone and we're counted righteous in God's sight because Christ's righteousness has been imputed or credited to us and we receive it by faith. Credited's a common word, imputed isn't anymore. When someone, suppose someone gave you a check for 500 pounds then you put it in the bank, your bank account would be credited with £500. That would be yours, no one could take it off you. That's it. That's what Christ's righteousness is for us. So we stand reconciled, we stand at peace with God, and we have that relationship with God. But it also brings peace between people. Um, Jesus, as we've looked at, brings down the dividing wall of hostility between Jewish and non-Jewish people in Christ. Um, the Berlin Wall collapsing was a great moment in history. Uh, it was a dividing wall that divided people. And then when there was un reunification, Germany celebrated. Germany wasn't divided anymore. And we have that in Christ, people, racial groups who were divided, who were hostile, are now brought together in one family, equal. No one is privileged above the other on the basis of race. And we are at peace with one another. And indeed, Jesus calls us 
to be peacemakers. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Why? Because that's what God does. He comes to make peace with us through Christ. And indeed, one of the fruits of the Spirit, the third one is peace. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But there's peace that we have. Yeah, peace with God, but peace with each other. We seek to be peacemakers. So let that be a lesson to us, that we should be um, forgiving, that we should be kind, that we should be loving, that we should be patient, that we should not keep a record of wrongs against people. We should be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We should be eager to do that. The honour of Christ and his church is more important than winning an argument. So be quick to forgive, be quick to apologise, be quick to reconcile. Because that is the image of God in us. That's how we are um, to imitate God. And indeed, it's a way of making us like Jesus. Because when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. And so we have here a beautiful message of peace, but it should lead to practice of peace. We should be not argumentative, not quarrelsome. You know, but the Bible puts being quarrelsome in a list of sins with sexual immorality. Romans 13. Do you think of quarreling and bickering like that? No, a Christian should be peaceable. Because this is what Christ came to bring. And this is what Christ commands us to be. And another type of peace Christ gives, the peace of conscience. Knowing that our sins are forgiven is heaven on earth. Knowing that we don't stand condemned is beautiful. Knowing that we have a father who we can come to and ask forgiveness for, that is joy everlasting. That we can come back to him again and again and ask his forgiveness. And he runs out to meet us when we genuinely repent. This is the message that Christ preached to us through the word, by the power of the Spirit. And in order for us to be like him, this is how we must pursue peace. Thirdly, Jesus gives access. Verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Martin Lloyd-Jones has a series of sermons on the book of Ephesians that the Banner of Truth do. And on the passage, when he gets to this, he said, Christians should pause at this verse and sit in silence. Like we did at 11 o'clock today. We, you pause because you want to reverence and give respect to something. And Lloyd-Jones says, when we come to this verse, we should pause. Because look at what Christ gives us. Jesus gives us access. Through him, Jesus, we have access in one spirit to the Father. That's the Trinity. Jesus gives us access to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. We looked at the Trinity when we looked at um, what is God in May and June. Go back and have a look at it. Uh, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being. God is one being in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Son became man and has two natures, God and man. And in his humanity, Jesus doesn't just give us justification. He gives us adoption, which is question 34. In the Shorter Catechism, adoption is an act of God's free grace, whereby where we become and are counted in the number of the children of God and have the privileges as sons. 
the same as Christ has. J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, said to be justified by God the judge is a great thing. To be adopted by God the Father is even greater. And this is the highest privilege. We have access to God by the Father. And remember the context Paul's talking about here. He said he's, he's talking about the temple being dismantled and walls being broken down. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, the, everybody could go into the outer court. Only Jewish people could go to the next level. Only priests could go to the altar and only the high priest and that once a year could go into the Holy of Holies. Well, that's not there anymore because Christ fulfilled it. And in him, we have access to the Father and we can go all, we're in the Father's presence all the time because the Spirit lives in us. The Spirit lives in us. He's caused us to be born again. He's caused us to be made holy and he continuously works in us to work and to will the good pleasure of God. And it's in Christ, being united to Christ by faith, that we have access to this. All the privileges of being God's children, all the wonderful things that God has, we have them through Christ. Stuart Tannen said in one of his hymns, all the blessings he deserves are poured on my unworthy soul. So God in Christ has brought us in and he's adopted us into his family. And again, to think of the prodigal son, the son is then given a party in Luke 15. Well, we are brought into the working of the Trinity. We've talked about this, God we talked about it last week, actually. God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his goodness, we looked at. And so God must be one in must be one God in three persons, because he was always good. So the Father was always good to the Son in the power of the Spirit. And so we, because the Son has become human, we're united to him and we share in that love of the Trinity forever and ever and ever and ever. We have access into the intimacy, into the glory, the blessedness, the majesty, the goodness, the generosity, the bliss of the blessed and holy Trinity. We have access through Christ, through him, with him and in him by the power of the Spirit. That's how we're united to him. We have access to the Father. He pours out the Spirit into our hearts by which we cry, Abba, Father. That's Romans 8 and Galatians 4. And we can call it because we're in Christ. That's why we say in Jesus' name. It's not a catchphrase like over and out. It means we are in Christ, united to him, one with him. And we can pray as in his merits and in his power because he is praying with us. And indeed, if you're praying, it's because, you know, think about this. We have the Christ's merit. We can say, in Jesus' name, I can ask God for this because I'm in Christ. I can claim his righteousness and say, God, can I have this? And I'm not asking because of my righteousness. I'm asking because of Jesus' righteousness. And the Holy Spirit is sent to help us to pray. And he makes our prayer fragrant and beautiful and glorious. And because, again, see how precious the doctrine of the, and practical the doctrine of the Trinity is. People say that, what difference does the Trinity make to my life? Well, if you pray, you, pray, you can pray to God because God is triune. You pray to the Father in Jesus' name, that means in his righteousness, and in the power of the Spirit. Christ died for your sins, yes. Well, Hebrews 9.14 said, he offered himself up to God by the power of the Spirit. You justify, you're born again, you've become a Christian. The Spirit's brought you to faith. God drew you to Christ by the power of the Spirit. The Spirit brought you to faith in Christ because God poured him out on you. All the things 
all the things that God has done, he's done for us through Christ by the power of the Spirit. So what difference does the Trinity make to our life? A lot. It's why we're Christians. And indeed, because we're united to Christ, we have the life of God in us by the power of the Spirit. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So Jesus is the centre of all the Bible. He's the centre of all of God's plans. He's the one who gives us righteousness. So let's, let's come to faith in him today. If you're not a Christian, we would encourage you to come to him. Come to Christ this very day. If you have come to Christ, commit to coming to church. This is how you grow in Christ. We, we, Acts 2 says it. They, the apostles, doctrine, the breaking of bread, fellowship and the prayers. Word, sacraments and prayer together as a church. Yes, you do those things, some of them, Bible reading and prayer in private. You can only do the sacraments in church. But we do word, prayer and sacrament together as well as in private. And that is where Christ preaches to us by the, these poor preachers that you know. But the Spirit, by the Word, helps us grow and forms us into the character of Jesus. So commit to coming to church and let's together delight in God. If you want a bit of reading material on the Trinity, I'll recommend two little books. John Owen, one of the Puritans, wrote a book called Communion with God, and it talked about the three persons of the Trinity having communion means fellowship, deep, spiritual, intimate fellowship with God and with each other. And a modern writer, Ryan McGraw, wrote a book called Knowing the Trinity. And he's also wrote a little book. I think I've got it here. Just excuse me. Ah, oh, yes. Is the Trinity Practical? You might get that quoted a bit more if you come to church on Sunday. But it's a great little booklet. That the life of God in the Trinity is what we're called to. That this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So come to Christ this very day. And know God. Have peace. Be reconciled. And have blessed joy in the triune God. Bless you.